Welcome back. Another knowledge clip about thermodynamics. We are still in chapter five, and this is a continuation of last knowledge clip, which was part three A, and here we come with part three B. And I promised you that I will tell you about how the equilibrium can be manipulated by coupling, which comes in this knowledge clip. So a protein can be depicted as you see here. It's a large uh, biological macromolecule which is composed of um, many amino acids that are connected along the chain of the protein molecule. Those amino acids are bound together by a so-called peptide bonds. Peptide bonds, which are here depicted in blue, are a bridge between the individual amino acids and they are linking along the entire length of the protein all the individual amino acids together. So here's an example of an amino acid this is glycine. You can have two glycines together and make them react so they do form a so-called dipeptide. So a peptide composed of two amino acids. And then you have um, this amine group and this carboxylic acid group form this peptide bond, which releases also a water molecule. A dehydration is happening. So let's take a look at the uh, Gibbs free energy for such a um, peptide bond formation. So first let's introduce the names. Those two are glycines and I will abbreviate them as just G in the following. Then that one is a glycyl glycine, which I will abbreviate as GG. And last there is a water, which will just be W. So the free energy of the reaction at standard conditions can be calculated with the free energies of formation of the products, these two, and the reactants. This formula is familiar to us. So to find the values of the free energies of formations of the um, products and reactants, we take a look, for instance, at this handbook of biochemistry and molecular biology. In that book, we will find a table for the free energy of formation for different amino acids. And then we can search in that table for the suitable um, amino acids that we have, which is glycine. By the way, these numbers, they have been obtained by measurements with a calorimeter and also by measuring the heat capacity. And those allow them to obtain the free energy of formations, which is given as a negative free energy of formation. That's why the number here is are positive. So we search for glycine. Here it is. Glycine has a free energy of formation of 90.3 kilocalories per mole, right? But we need that in kilojoules per mole. So we need to calculate with a conversion factor, which gives us minus 377.8 kilojoules per mole. Okay, those are the, this is the free energy of formation for the glycines. Now for the glycyl glycine, we search in the table, there are peptides, and you find here glycyl glycine. Glycyl glycine has a free energy of formation of minus 116.6 kilocalories per mole, which equals to minus 487.9 kilojoules per mole. Then last, we need also the free energy of formation for the water, which is also one of the products. And that I find in a different table to be two, minus 237.1 kilojoules per mole. So now I can plug those numbers into the um, formula for the free energy of reaction that I do here. So the stoichiometric coefficient for the product glycyl glycine is one. So you see I multiply it with the free energy of formation here. Then for water, the stoichiometric coefficient is also one. And then here's the number for water. And then for the glycines, we have a stoichiometric coefficient of two, which then I need to subtract from the products. Okay. And that gives us a free energy of reaction of plus 30.6 kilojoules per mole. You see, it's a positive number, and that shows that this reaction is not spontaneous. Right? Remember, a free energy of formation must be negative for a reaction. Ah, not a free energy of formation, but a free energy of a reaction must be negative for it to be spontaneous. Good. So um, now, what does that free energy of reaction mean for the equilibrium? So we calculate the equilibrium constant with the definition. Like first, let's look at the definition. It is the concentrations of the products multiplied with each other. 
divided by the concentration of the reactants and their stoichiometric coefficient 2 in the exponent here. So, but the actual definition of the equilibrium constant K is the concentrations divided by their standard concentrations, right? C standards of each reactant and product. So now let's take a look what are those standard concentrations. For glycyrglycine and for um, glycine, it is one mole per liter because those are usually dissolved substances and we give their concentration in the solution as one mole per liter at the standard state. For water, on the other hand, which is the solvent, we have the standard concentration 55.6 mole per liter. Now, think about it. During the reaction, one water molecule is formed for each reaction of two glycines. But the water concentration is 55.6 moles per liter in the surrounding. So adding one water molecule to that is not going to change the water concentration uh, significantly. Therefore, we can say that actually the standard water concentration is the same as the water concentration at equilibrium. And you see, if that number and that number are the same, then the ratio of these two numbers is 1. And that's why I can just express the equilibrium constant with the concentration of the glucyl glucine and the glycines here. In, and I don't need the water anymore. It can because it is 1, the ratio of these two, simply. OK, but we don't know the concentrations. So we cannot calculate the equilibrium constant that way, but we do know the free energy of reaction, which we calculated previously. So plugging that value now into this exponential expression for the equilibrium constant gives us an equilibrium constant K of 4.3 times 10 to the negative 6. It's a very small number. What does that number tell us? If that number is so small, that means the um, number of glycylglycines in the numerator of this equilibrium constant expression must be very small compared to the, the concentration of the glycines in the um, denominator. That basically means at equilibrium the um, amount of glycylglycines is so low and it's primarily glycines that will be present at equilibrium. That number, that's why the number is so small. We say the equilibrium is shifted to the reactant side of the reaction, right? So it's not favorable to form glycyrglycines, as we've already noticed from the positive free energy of formation. So the low value, to summarize, of K shows that in equilibrium, mainly loose amino acids are present. But in the cell, we are, the cell is able to form um, um, proteins out of amino acids. How does that work if the equilibrium is shifted on the loose amino acids? It works because in the cell, this reaction is coupled with the ATP hydrolysis. So in this example, two ATPs are hydrolyzed to form two ADPs and two phosphates. The free energy of reaction for these two ADPs is negative 56 kilojoules per mole. You can see the negative value is larger than the positive value for the free energy of peptide bond formation, which I now abbreviate here with PEP in the index. And effectively, the reaction of both the hydrolysis of ATP and the peptide bond formation can be expressed with this reaction equation, two glycines plus two ATPs give us glycyl, one glycylglycine, two, uh, one water, two ADPs, and two inorganic phosphates. The effective Gibbs free energy of reaction at standard conditions calculates to the sum of the energy of reaction for the peptide bond formation and the free energy of reaction for the ATP hydrolysis, which gives us a negative number of 24.4 kilojoules per mole. Now you can calculate with that effective free energy of, of reaction the equilibrium constant, which is given by the uh, multiplication of the product concentrations and their stoichiometric coefficients divided by the reactant concentrations and their stoichiometric coefficients. And the number is given then by plugging in the effective free energy of formation into the exponent here. And that gives us 28,000. 
positive 28,000. Compare that to the equilibrium constant um, for the peptide bond formation alone, which was 10 to the neg negative 6. Now it's 28,000. That means the reaction now lies on the product side, right? Due to the coupling with the ATP hydrolysis, we are now forming glycyrglycines, ADPs, and inorganic phosphates in equilibrium. And that coupling effect has then basically allowed for the peptide bond formation. Fascinating. So you can depict it like this, a pulley system where you have a mass here pulling on this rope, which represents the peptides out of loose amino acids that have a free energy of a reaction larger than zero. So without the coupling to ATP, you will have the loose amino acids being the primary um, equilibrium product. But if you put the heavy weight um, ATP hydrolysis with this large negative free energy of reaction, then the reaction basically proceeds to the products um, due to the effective negative free energy of reaction. And that's what the cell is basically doing in these ribosomes. The messenger RNA is bringing the genetic code in which the sequence of amino acids is coded. These carrier molecules bring amino acids, which are then processed and bond together via peptide bonds due to the ATP hydrolysis to form proteins that can then diffuse away into the cell and carry out the important biological functions. Summary. We learned in this uh, knowledge clip compilation of 3A and B that reactions um, usually don't proceed to pure products, but they have an equilibrium uh, concentrations, right? The, at equilibrium, which is indicated by these two arrows, you have a certain concentration of products and reactants. And the equilibrium constant K depends on the free energy of reaction that we can obtain by um, looking up the, the free energies of formation. So the equilibrium constant K is calculated with the Gibbs free energies of formation. That's what I wanted to conclude also here. Thank you.